See the Louis, I think. You know? Yesterday we left at see the Louis. I'll take one or two of his pieces. And then we go back and go over to somebody else. <clears throat> the two poems written by him in the late thirties, you see, of the ninth of the twentieth century, Flight to Australia and Nabara. Now these are absolutely modernist, if you like to call them modernist in their subject matter. But the poetry can take a high rank even as poetry because the poet has the capacity here to succeed poetically. Even sometimes he retains the old forms, he rhymes sometimes in his verses, and yet poetically he is able to give a form which carries well, the, the, the spirit of man in that modernist expression which brings something more than what has been brought in the realm of expression in, in creation of poetry. Even newspaper reports subject like this flight to Australia is a newspaper report practically. You see, it is a flight by two people who were discharged from the army after the First World War when the war came to an end. Barrer and McIntosh, these were the two, you know, flight lieutenants and they were there to go to Australia back. And they took a well, broken aeroplane, almost, uh, you know, in, in a very, very bad condition, uh, mechanically not at all fit for flight. And they flew for, with that aircraft to Australia. That is a story. And the report came out in the paper how many times they had accident on the way and so on, so on. Well, this gives the poet the subject matter with which he starts, you see. He takes the aeroplane, a flight to Australia in 1920 as a subject. And then he says, a hundred miles, I won't take the whole poem because it's rather long. A hundred miles without pressure they flew, the engine fighting for breath, and its heart nearly burst before they dropped to land. That is before they went to Paris. You see, just when they reached Paris, they had to drop down at Lyons or somewhere else. And uh, this perception of the consciousness behind apparent inconscient material machine, you see, this is not merely an act of fancy or imagination as far as I suppose, but it is a perception of a truth which is now dawning on mankind. That mechanical appliances are not as devoid of life as we have been till now thinking. Well, that is what the poet has perceived intuitively here. Engine fighting for breath, it hard nearly burst before they drop to land. You see, he puts the the so whole almost the you know the consciousness into the machine. Yes, it would make true uh, the old in Upanishadic saying which said, "Matter is Brahman." You see, matter is a manifestation of the infinite, and the, according to our concept, the infinite is conscious. You see, so that here he perceives the consciousness in the mold of matter. Take the second point, for instance. How he frees the pilots, you know, the these two air, airmen, from their physical limitations and uh, gives them almost, you know, how man can overcome. Body is generally supposed to be capable of a certain limit of extending its power of endurance, power of performance, power of strength and so on. Here he shows that the normal capacity of the body is overpassed. Their spirit reached forward and took the controls. Their spirit reached forward and took the controls while their fingers froze. It was so cold that their fingers froze. Then who took the control? For their spirit reached forward and took the controls while their fingers froze. Yes, because Spirit is mightier than the body. The spirit is mighty, it can command the body, mightier than the nerve. And it is that which triumphs not merely over the body, but even over the machine. Then he says, the plane was not, you know, worthy of 
of travel and it was not really certified it was i think they got it for a song you see they were getting rid of many you know useless airplanes and so they got it almost all right if you want take it like that for it because they were fighting in the air and they were volunteers sometimes government used to do like that take away if you like all right that means to say you spend your fortune over it and put it to order and do whatever you like with it he described the plane for their plane was a laugh a patch brittle as matchstick a bubble a lift for a ghost a lift for a ghost not for human beings you see bolts always working loose of propeller cylinder bearer instrument faulty filter magneto each strut unsound well that is the description now this machine seems to be mechanically nothing isn't it for laugh even the technical details of the parts of the aeroplane add to the intensification of the sense of you know i mean uh, wonder and mystery of the apparently impossible flight which becomes an accomplished fact by the combination of the spirit of the pilots acting on the dead inert machine and the machine responding to the action by carrying out the will of the pilot in spite of all scientific and mechanical imperfections that is what you find here matter is inert you see and the spirit is consciousness well there here is a play of action and interaction of the two the spirit acts and matter seems to react that is how it it seems to work you see <laughs> and uh, the power of conscious response now uh, you know and uh, he is endowing matter with a power of response and uh, it's not merely a feat of poetical imagination but i think it's a perception of a profound truth which is going to dawn on mankind perhaps after some time probably even the scientists might discover it after some well 25 30 40 years we never know and then he describes how they flew little our graph can show you draw a graph generally it shows the flight you know what they do in the in the what is it called radar is it not you get a graph of the flight yes little our graph can show the line they trace through space of the heart's passionate patience they could not i cannot represent it says little our graph can show the line they trace through space of the heart's passionate patience how soft drifts of sleep piled on their senses deep and they dug themselves out often how the plane was a weight how the plane was a weight that hung and swung on their aching nerves and how din drilled through their skull and sight sickened so slow earth filtered past below yet never failed never heart clung to high and brain kept its course and the hand its skill now you see the limitation of the physical one and uh, uh, who worked the machine that is you can now see the description is very clear here here you find again the objectification of the spiritual and the matter depending upon the power of the spirit reacting and even hanging on to the spiritual the plane doesn't work on its own power at all it seems here you see uh, to the consciousness of the pilots isn't it you see little our graph can show the line they trace through space of the heart's passionate patience it was that graph which you must trace he says how oft drill sleep piled on their sense and they to dig out of the sleep which piled on them like ice you see yes and how the plane was a weight plane was only a material weight and it was hanging on their aching nerves and the dill drilling through their skull and sight sicken earth filtered past below it looked as if earth was not at all visible you see yet never failed never heart clung to height not the aeroplane you see how he is transferring one from the other 
the, the it is not merely you know what you call personification it's not that it is a deeper perception of the power of spirit over matter one and capacity of the inconscient matter to respond to the spirit that is the point you see and that is what he this is like a newspaper report that he's making out a fine poem out of it <clears throat> The clinging to height from the plane to the heart almost brings the picture of the plane hanging on to the heart and supported by the brave heart without any justification for it on the plane of matter. It should have fallen down and gone to pieces. It is not the plane but the brain that kept its course. Yes, that's it. Suggesting that if the brain had not kept the course, the plane might have crashed. Well, the plane does not always do, you know, doesn't satisfy the condition. So he said, wrapped for the undercarriage, radiator crack, in pieces compass crook, fallen all to confusion. Their winged hope was a heap of scrap. This aeroplane, the second hand, and it was, you see, war aeroplane, so finished. Their winged hope was a heap of scrap but unsplintered their courage. <laughs> yes, you see, the courage was unsplintered, that's it. And uh, now you see, that, that gives you some idea of the, and the fusillage starts working again, the poet says, they, means the pilots, they gave faith to rise re rejuvenated from the ruin. They gave faith to the fusillage, you see, to rise from the ruin. You can see the subject matter because I don't want to take the whole of the time over this poem, one of his uh, best poems in a certain sense, you see. Oh. We have done his other poems, isn't it? Yes, Magnetic Mountain, did we do yes. here? Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Take this Stephen, Stephen Spender, we take uh, some, one or two examples from Stephen Spender. Stephen, rather, P-H-E-N, it is Stephen Spender. I met him in, in uh, I think, Hare Street, somewhere in London. Um, very, very self-opinion. A perception of, uh, yeah, now here you find a clear perception of subjective personalities in man and a central being. Just as we in the yogic practice also have tried to see the separation of the witness consciousness and the nature, personality or flow of nature in mind, in life, in emotion, in suggestions of the, of the body. So here you find the poet is perceiving something like the, you know, multi-personality of man, if you like. And I, he says, and I can never be a be great man. And I can never be great man. The ego is not great. Central I is surrounded by I eating, I loving, I angry, I expecting. And the great I planted in him has nothing to do with all this. Now that shows, you see, the, 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 the multi-personality, nature personality, which is only a working of, you know, the flow of nature, and the subjective consciousness, which is independent of it, and which really is the I, I mean, the great I. So he says, an I means egoistic sense, you see, egoistic personality cannot be a great, cannot be great man. He doesn't say a great man, cannot be great man. It cannot be great. Something great is that which is using all these personalities, I loving and angry and eating and expecting. Well, it is all those that are vital personality or physical personality and are limited by the, by the nature, you see. Perception, clear perception of the separation of the central being, the soul, the purusha as we call it, who not only is surrounded by physical and vital personalities, even by mental ones. The central being in man, which is his true self, is untouched by all this and grows by its experience of nature through these personalities. And uh, it is this uh, great difficulty of human beings generally, because a psychological difficulty in fact, the integration of personality or rather of individuality 
is the man's problem today. How to integrate the separate personality is the man. It is the central being alone that can, by using its inherent freedom and power, govern these diverse personalities if it becomes, as in the poet case, it has become conscious of its own self, then it can organize and integrate all the personalities in such a way as to create a harmonious being. Well, that is one suggestion which he gives. Another is also interesting, you see. The knowledge which mind and senses give, Sri Arunda has written in Life Divine and we didn't pursue that subject because we stopped at the first end of Life Divine. I mean first book of Life Divine. But later in the second book he works out the process by which knowledge is acquired. Two processes. Separative knowledge and knowledge by identity. Now in that separative knowledge he puts the whole knowledge that is acquired by the animal kingdom and man with his senses and with his intellect. And he shows that this projection of sense on the object in order to perceive or to contact it and know it, and mind working upon this sensation is an effort at identity, really speaking. It is really trying to become one with the, with the, with the object of knowledge. When, we see, when one sees a tree, it is not that he wants to see a tree. But the effort is to project the sense of sight and to make the mind work upon it to find out, well, how far it is one with me. It's a process of trying identification. Only it is imperfect because it is done externally by resorting to, uh, for so our limited power of sense. Sense itself is limited. You cannot see beyond a certain range. Therefore, you have to increase the range of sight by telescope or by some other instrument, you see. By itself, even the, the limitation of these instruments given to men will automatically put a limit to the power of identification further up, you see. But the effort is an identity. All knowledge is an effort at identity. And, that is, and he shows that there is a consciousness in man in who, which can use directly this knowledge by identity and get the knowledge. It's not necessary to to bring in the, the intervention of sense and mind. It's not necessary. If you go through the direct process, the knowledge by identity would be complete because that identity would be inner identity, not dependent on sense or mind, working on the sensation. Well, here the poet has perceived something vaguely of this process of identity when one acquires knowledge or tries to acquire knowledge through the sense. He says, for instance, Stephen Spender, it is, you see, never being, but always at the edge of being. I am not in my central self, so to say, but at the edge of being. My head, like death mass, is brought into the sun, observing rose, gold, eyes, an admired landscape. My senses record the act of wishing. My senses record the act of wishing. Wishing to be rose, gold, landscape. I claim fulfillment in the fact of loving. Now here, you see, he is pointing out indirectly without, well, I don't know whether he's fully conscious. You see, it's very difficult. But uh, what he writes under the stress of his experience is true to the extent that it goes. It is the, really speaking, analysis of process of knowledge by sense and mind working upon sensation. That when a sensation is received, there is an impulse to identify. Impulse to identify. It is not complete. Therefore, identification remains incomplete. Therefore, knowledge remains incomplete. And uh, you get when you, one has the impulse to identify himself with the object, he gets not only the knowledge of the object, but the delight which is present there, because that is what we have seen in Life Divine, that uh, infinite self-existence, consciousness, and infinite delight, that is the ultimate form of the omnipresent reality. 
omnipresent reality is infinite consciousness, infinite existence, infinite delight. And when the sense succeeds in perceiving the object that is behind, it is full of delight. It gets the delight also. Delight which is already there. It thinks the delight is here. No, delight is everywhere. And it is this perception of the delight somewhere outside through the intervention of sense which really makes the delight um, something which is personal. Delight manifesting in a moment of time. The delight is eternal all the time, but uh, the acquisition or the experience of delight in a particular moment gives it an intensity which becomes an acme of experience for the individual. You see, for the individual it becomes unique. Unique in the sense that he is able to perceive the delight. It's not the delight is absent. Delight is present all the time. The question for the individual is when and how does he perceive it? Well, the act of sensation worked upon by the mind the poet says, my head is like a death mask. I am not a living being. You see, my head is like a death mask. I have put on the mask. And it is taken, brought into the sun. And light, light of consciousness, that is to say. When the light of consciousness works through the death mask, it observes a rose, it go, observes gold, it observes eyes, it observes landscape, which it admires. An admired landscape. And my senses record the act of wishing. It is not merely a photographic plate that is turned around, which is no subject to, you know, reaction. It is not receptive, it only, not only sensory nerve, but uh, you, what you call the, it is called, uh, you know, um, the, 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 the reception that goes back is called motor nerves, is it not? Motor nerves. Well, the, the motor nerves send back the subjective response from inside. The sensory nerve takes the sensation, the motor nerve bring, bring back the sensation. It's not a mechanical response. When it comes back, it's not like photographic plate in which there is no response. Here is a response with a subjective judgment. I like it, I don't like it, this is good, this is beautiful, it's, it's pleasant and so on. So, well, there is immediately an addition. Now, that is an act of consciousness. So it's, a, it's an act of wishing. And the senses record the act of wishing, wishing to be rose. In fact, when I see a rose, it means I want to become the rose. That is the perception of knowledge. That is knowledge, you see. No, even normally when man gets some information about outside world, it is an imper imperfect process of identification. And that is the poet has hit upon it without uh, perhaps uh, knowing how he was himself trying to give expression to this knowledge really by identity. Well, there is something about love also. He speaks very finely about the experience of love. But uh, no time about all those many things which are beautiful in his writing. For instance, I'll only quote, Your body is stars. Your body is stars. He's referring to the beloved, perhaps. And this is, uh, whose million glitter here? Same idea we find in Whitman, you see. You are the, you see, but the expression is modernist. I am lost among the branches of the sky. Now he has said, you see, your body is the stars. Whose million glitter here. And then he says, I am lost among the branches of the sky. Here in my breast and here in my nostrils, our movements range through miles, and when we kiss, the moment widens to enclose long years. Oh, that, you see, takes you to the perception of a uh, sense experience transmuted into the movement of consciousness, taken away from the physical altogether, but based upon the sense evidence, you see, uh, on his um, other. He is also a, he was pro-communist for some years, you must know, you see, he's a Stephen Spender. And then he joined the Communist Party and then found out all the things that they were doing. And then he backed out of it and then he, they wrote, what was it? The God that failed. That was an article, God that failed. That was against communism by seven or six intellectuals of the world. Not one nation, 
One was Steven Spender, but one was from France, one was from Austria, third was Germany, and fourth was from Russia, fifth was from somewhere else, America, I don't know. But six people wrote a series of articles continued. You see in a weekly paper, The God That Failed. And Stephen Spender there, for the first time, gave expression to his, well, uh, opposition to communism. But he was convinced communist at one time, and I don't believe that he has completely given up the, the, the central truth about communism. Because communism as a policy and as a, as a, you know, as a state is one thing, and communism as a belief in a reconstitution of society would be quite different. And probably communism, I mean, as a, as a based, based on principle, might be quite something not so bad as, as it works out in a, in a state or a constitution. You see, in working out, people always bring out their bad, you know, the worst qualities and uh, try to uh, either to, to use their ego or ambition to carry out a fine principle. And the principle may not be at fault at all. As principle, it might be quite tenable. Now, just see how he writes about communist attitude, and it will show that uh, there is something about it which he says is not so bad as, as it is worked out in the state. He says, in railway halls, on pavements near the traffic, they beg. Their eyes made big by empty staring and only measuring time like blank clock. He is referring to the poor human beings, you see. In railway halls, on pavements near the traffic, they beg. Their eyes made big by empty staring, and only measuring time like blank clock. You see, the feeling of collective consciousness and perception of this identity and sympathy. Time merely drives these lives which do not live as tides, as tides push rotten stuff along the shore. Fine image, you see. Time merely drives these lives which do not live as tides push rotten stuff along the shore. They are not, not in the current of life, you see. Now here the cruelty of life and waste of human material, which conditions of life compels, is seen by the poet and felt. Time drives these like rotten stuff. And so the poet says, I, he says further up in that same poem, you see, I do not want to make them birds upon my singing tree. Because I don't want to write fine poetry about this thing. And that's why he says, I do not want to make them birds upon my singing tree, but let the wrong cry out raw as wounds. This time forgets and never heals. That's, you see, let it cry like raw wound and not make it a fine bird and what a wonderful thing. No, I want it to cry like raw wound because time does not heal these wounds. Letting time do doesn't work. Uh, it's, a, it's a tremendous, uh, you know, way of putting the problem of inequality in life on a basis of a cosmic or universal sympathy. You see, after all, uh, one has to see this problem. Further up, uh, it's too long, so I'll take one more passage. And then what does he want? Solution. So there is a solution. Into the image of a heart. That feeds separate functions with blood they need. For what they make, we will save the wealth of the dispossessed world and let those riches pour their fertilizing river, delta, across the starved sand of the peoples. Now he's giving the image of a living heart, you see, and functions that are well, supported by heart, but each supported in its own proper functioning. That's just the same as the Vedic idea which I gave when we began the talk on the, on the, on the human psyche, human uh, unity. Remember, Sahastra Shisra Purusha Sahastra 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 a man with a thousand head and thousand eyes and thousand arms, 
Well, here he is taking that image here in a different way. Image of a heart that feeds separate functions. With blood they need. For what they make, we will shape the wealth of the dispossessed world and let those riches pour their fertilizing river delta across the starved sand of the people. The sand of the people is starved and we will like to send the, the, the course of living blood on the sand that are starved. Now that gives an idea of a living organism, collectivity to be realized as a living entity, as group soul and the group soul well supplying from the central heart all the capacity of producing or creating wealth or creating whatever was necessary being given to each part according to its growth and necessity and whatever remained flowing over to the you know starved sand of the people the rest will be you know to fertilize the sands of the people now that gives an idea of a pumping, not by merely, you know, a, a mechanical pump, by a living heart. A heart that throws all the needs of the, of the groups of people mm. according to their necessity and whatever surplus remains goes to, well, fertilize the sands that are starving. Image of wealth of the people as a heart that is feeding and nourishing all the diverse functions of the body social enriching the starved sands of the people and also turning the sands into a fertilizing delta. You will find that, you see. Now I think about that, this is all right. We'll take some, there is one or two fine poems also, but we'll let them pass. Now we take Herbert Reed. He is Sir Herbert Reed, a fine critic, art critic and a poet and a prose writer also of good merit. He has written a fine book. Education for Peace, which is one of the very fine writings. Oh, I, don't know. I don't know who is going to listen to what he writes. He has written after the Second World War, Education for Peace. And he has tried to make out a case that education must be centered around art. This is his wonderful thesis and very well done. He says that all education must be centered on art in order to promote First of all, a fine sensibility, fine sensitiveness in the young people and promote in them a sense of beauty in such a way that any conflict or any breaking of harmony would jar on them, you see. Uh, he's, he has written the book is fine one. He gave me present as a, when I met him. You see, I, <laughs> I met him in London in 55. A very fine intellect, very keen mind and a fine critic also. Now, in many ways, he's a remarkable in voicing the inmost spiritual tendencies of the new coming age. And this, this poetry of Herbert Spence, Herbert Reed, he seems to receive through an inner sight powerful images that express directly some spiritual reality which he perceives. Oh, let me take all, but he has written, his, one of his poems well known is Mutations of the Phoenix. Mutations of the phoenix. It's symbolic. It's not phoenix at all. He is referring not to the phoenix. Uh, it is a human mind that is a phoenix. You know, phoenix is a bird. It's a, it's a mythic bird that uh, burns its body and then comes out rejuvenated, lives again out of the ashes. It rises. It's a human mind is a process of its rise in the nest of the finite mentality, gradually burning itself up and ending in the golden light of the regions of reality. Well, that's my interpretation because there is no other sense that I could see in the poem. Throughout this poem, there is a perception of the universal consciousness. And he sees behind the appearance, even behind the appearance of differences and separation of the physical, one flame of life. This is the line. The blood burns in our limbs. The blood burns in our limbs with an even flame. Not more or less like that, even flame. 98.4 temperature, isn't it? Yes, <laughs> that's it. <laughs> the blood burns in our limbs with an even flame. The same sundering flame has burned the world and left this crumbling bands. One flame burns many phenomena. 
see the perception of one flame of light. Wonderful compactness of expression you will see here, holding within self a world of significance because it implies the rise of light from matter. And the same, some flame of original fire burning has left this material world and sent as remnants and given rise to life like a continuing flame and it burns in human limbs. This combustion of food that maintains the normal temperature of the human body. The line, one burns many phenomena, reminds of the Upanishadic revelation. It is one fire that has entered the world and has become every form that we see. That is, uh, you see, Rupam, uh, Agnir Yathaiko Bhuvaram Pravishto, Rupam Rupam Pratirupo Bhuva. You see, that is the line in the Upanishad. Like the fire that has entered the world and has become form and form and each form that we perceive. You see, this flame burning in man is first subdued to the need of the physical. But the flame steadily burns, burns everything and rises, the very nerves and muscles. This is the line he gives. The flame burns all, uses the ducts and chambers of our tunneled flesh, uses the ducts and the chambers of our tunneled flesh to focus flame to its innate intensity. The flame of life, working through the physical body and nervous system, yes. ducts and the chambers of our tunneled flesh, to focus itself to an in intensity of mental perception, heart perception, you see. It concentrates this fire to intensity, when it is able to perceive a deep feeling or a keen thought or a comprehensive truth, a reality. And she says further up, he almost feels that the knowledge perceived is not, not there, but here, you see. How persuade a mind that the thing seen is habitat, habitant of the cerebral cave and has elsewhere no materiality? That this is matter is here, not there. It may be something, but its materiality is here. It is this that says it is matter. Has elsewhere no materiality. All knowledge according to this line would be subjective only, is it not? And it belongs to the mind. The world is a flux, but the flux takes the place in the mind. And uh, Herbert Reed almost argues here that all knowledge is only a mode of the subject. You see, our world is visible, invisible. No, excuse me. Our world is invisible. Till vision makes a finite reflection. Consciousness is a fundamental fact. That's what we, I posited in Life Divine. And that is, that is what he wants to say here. Our world is invisible. Till vision makes a finite reflection. Then the world is finite. You understand? Very simple in one way. Yes. Then the world is finite, cast in the mold and measure of a finite instrument. Well, that's what Sirondo said. <laughs> in life divine argument that mind is a limited instrument. Its capacity to know is limited because what is to be known is infinite and the knower is finite. To not be commensurate, cannot grasp the whole thing at a time. Now, he puts it differently, but he puts it correctly in one sense. And as it is coming from a Western mind and a modern man, modernist poetry, you can see I am trying to illustrate Shirondo's future poetry and its prognosis. We have seen that this will be the strain that will come out, is it not? The forerunners and the modern poets. Well, I am trying to illustrate from living poets uh, the the... the the truth that we can see was given to us in future poetry, that that should come gradually more and more. I don't say this is the dominant note, but this is note among the best representatives. There is no doubt about that. Now he says, for in further line, the phoenix, mutations of the phoenix. Phoenix is that bird of which we spoke, you know, the mental consciousness. Phoenix burns spiritually. In the docile brain's recesses, 
Its ultimate spark is unknowable because its existence continues only so long as a spark lasts. Then he evokes the spirit, Phoenix. He says, Phoenix, it's a spirit of man in mind, bird of terrible pride, ruddy eye and iron beak. Come, leave the incinerary rest, nest, spread your wings, and soaring in the golden light, survey the world, hover against the highest sky. Now you see the image and the symbol that brings out is almost, uh, you know, a call to the human mind to break the barriers of intellectuality and mind and to go beyond where the golden light of the truth is already self-existent and he's uh, invoking the spirit of mind to go beyond. And it's a, it's a phoenix, it's a bird that can fry. You see, the symbol is very apt. It's a call to the mind, the finite instrument of half light and half darkness to rise above the limitations of the region to the golden light that's above. And then he says, the mind is in prison with a high small window barred against escape. Window is high. It cannot go. Barred against escape. A decoy of light enters there. You know, decoy is one that that uh, entices the, the victim to the point where it will be shot. Is it not for shikar? I mean for uh, yes. A decoy of light enters there, reminding the tortured brain that somewhere unseen, the white perfection of sun's way exists. You are in prison as mind. And only a barred window which does not allow you to escape is there through which the echo of light enters. And persuade this mind that here, here you are in darkness and only one window, but outside there is a big world of sunlight. You see, the image is quite uh, apt and quite uh, what, what Shirnu said, that that perception is going to come and it will perceive in the smallest incident of life something of that uh, supreme truth which is breaking up on the world, you see. Yes, um, but the same mind that is in prison has seen beauty, beauty is beyond its reach, perfections never to be attained, some state of high serenity exists beyond the range of our febrile senses. Beyond the range of sense there is a perfection, which if mind remains mind and sense remains only what it is, it won't be able to attain. Beyond space there is a beauty not to be seized by men in prison who but languish in the shackles carried from womb to warm unto the release of death, unto the dark return of world's harmony. Dark return is return to matter. When you return to matter, well, then the whole struggle ends. Now you find there the perception of supra-intellectual reality, some ray of its perception that it is a realm of perfection, realm of beauty, realm of harmony. And he has also written a song of the British soldier and song of the German soldier, very fine two songs after the Second World War. Beautiful two pieces, you see. And there, in that piece, I will not take the whole thing, it's be too big, but just two lines from the uh, the dream of the English British soldier who has returned from the war, you see, and he's thinking about and what has happened. He says, Why should I believe in any myself even? You see, because if things are going to happen as they do, what is the meaning of myself and so on? For what is self without God? My soul is less than nothing lost unless in this life it can build. A bridge to life eternal. If I cannot connect myself with a source of eternity, well, my uh, individual isolated me would have no sense because it doesn't seem to fit in some, some cosmic or universal or supreme harmony. Well, there you see the strain of which Sherundo speaks in his future poetry, fully justified by the performances of some of the uh, writers of modern times. I'll take two more, and uh, I think with that, perhaps we'll come to some kind of change. 
There is a poet in Ashram, a Farsi poet, K.D. Sethna, but his name is changed by his, uh, being a disciple. He is called Amal Kiran. In the Indian name, he asked for some names of Sri Aruna game, Amal Kiran. Amal Kiran means a ray without, uh, without any mixture in it, you see. So far as poetry is concerned, it is true, I think. Well, he wrote a poem long ago. He calls it the errant life. Errant life. It was written some years back, but it is one of his best pieces. And I give it as example of so many European writers. Now I take one or two, you know, from this side to show that it is the, 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 the prophecy or the, the reading which Chirundo gave in future poetry is getting uh, justification in performance of many of the artists today. He writes, this errant life is dear although it dies. This errant life, life which is errant, you know, full of, yes, wandering and errors, both. It is a suggestion of error also, you see. This errant life is dear although it dies. And human lips are sweet, although they but sing of stars estranged from us. Where disharmony in life and still, and youth's emprise is wondrous yet, although an unsure thing. The enterprising spirit of young men, the adventure of young people, you see. Youth's emprise is wondrous yet, although an unsure thing. Then suddenly he feels life is errant and one is attached to life. Well, um, sweetness is felt in human relationship and yet it is not all harmonious. Youth is capable of an adventure but also afflicted with uncertainty. And then he is now feeling that supposing I have an aspiration for the highest reality. How can I, with these contradictions, approach it? You see, therefore, in the next line says, Sky lucent bliss, untouched by earthiness. Wide like sky, shining, sky lucent bliss, delight. Untouched by earthiness, you are unearthly and ethereal. I fear to soar. Less tender bonds decrease. The same idea as uh, as the poet of the Hound of Heaven. What is his name? Francis Thompson. You see, same idea here. I fear to soar. Less tender bonds decrease. He says, I want to fly into the sky of this sky lucent bliss. I fear to soar. Less tender bonds decrease. Then he says, if thou desirest my weak self to outgrow its mortal longings, lean down from above. Temper the unborn light no thought can trace. Suffuse my mood with a familiar glow, for it is with mouth of clay that I supplicate. Speak to me heart to heart, words intimate. And all thy formless glory, turn to love and mold thy love into a human face. See? That is poetry. He is feeling that strength of aspiration and also weakness of the human nature at the same time. A simultaneous feeling of the two in intensity, which is poetic here, quite well expressed. In his expression, the intensity is fully justified and, and successful, I mean, that way, you see. He is appealing to the supreme power to come down. He says, I want, but I cannot. You see, the point is that uh, it's mortal longing lean down from above, for it is with mouth of clay that I supplicate. I am of earth, earthly, you see. And speak to me, therefore, heart to heart, words intimate, and all thy formless go return to love, and mold thy love into a human face. See, there you find the power of transmutation of ordinary experience and the power of uh, appealing to the highest uh, I mean, flight of human uh, aspiration into a wonderfully strong poetic expression. 
there is the one poem of Sherbindo which I will put as his own illustration of his own poetry, you see, because he also illustrates his own prophecy, you see. And it's a short poem, not the epic I'm taking from one of his short poems, Thought the Paraclete. Paraclete is an advocate. You know, Jesus Christ was called the Paraclete. Yes, Paraclete is one who intercedes on your behalf with some higher power. Paraclete is an advocate, really, advocate, one who intercedes, comes in between a greater power and somebody else and intercedes on his, that's called thought, the paraclete. The power of thought or mind working on the cosmic scale is a paraclete. Mind as an instrument in the cosmos is only a paraclete. Intercessor and advocate which puts this material in conscience and life in contact with a greater reality beyond life. You see, that's the work of thought. Mind is only there to put the two in contact, you see. The, the self, spirit and life on this side, matter on this side and so on. Now here, it is an epic height and just tremendous affair. So you have to <laughs> get your mind ready for that because it is, it is, it is avalanche, you see. <laughs> As some bright archangel in vision flies, is envisaging this thought, cosmic thought power as an archangel. How do you say archangel or archangel? Archangel. Archangel, yes, archangel. Archangel is flying in vision. Flying in deep, deep dream caught spirit immensities. He's plunged in dream caught. Spirit immensities. Immensity is the spirit which it has caught in its dream. Dream caught spirit immensities. Where does it fly? Past the long green crests of the seas of life. Past the orange skies of mystic mind. Flew my thought self lost in the vasts of God. Sleepless, wide, great glimmering wings of wind bore the gold red seeking of feet that trod space and time's mute vanishing ends. The face lustered, pale blue eye lined of the hippogriff, ermine, soul daring the boneless ways. Over world bare summits of timeless being gleam. The deep twilights of the world abyss failed below some realms of supernal seeing. Crimson white mooned oceans of causeless bliss drew its vague heart yearnings with voices sweet, hungering, large souled to surprise. The unconned secret, white of fire, veiled of the last beyond, crossing power-swept silences, rapture stunned, climbing high far ether's eternal sun. Thought, the great-winged wanderer Pericles, disappeared, slow singing a wordless roof, flameless. Uh, slow singing a flameward room. Self was left alone, limitless, nude, immune. Now you see, this is a, this is a giving a, almost a symbolic picture of the thought power working in the universe. It is similar to a bird like a eagle that is flying, but it is like an archangel, you see, archangel, no? Archangel. Archangel, yes, I must correct my pronunciation, archangel, it's like an archangel. This bird that flies, the thought, this eagle thought, all thought that the whole humanity knows about, 
and will know in the future and what it has known in the past, all thought. Is this archangel? It is this bird that flies and it is a paraclete. It intercedes on behalf of matter, connects it with the spirit and disappears. Its function is to put the two in contact. What does it do? Just see again. It, is, it passes the long green crests of seas of life. It does not get into entanglement of life. The power of thought, like the eagle, flies over seas of life. All seas. And what are the seas of life like? Long green crests of the seas of life. You get a full picture. You could paint it. <laughs> yes, long green crests of the seas of life pass. Pass the orange skies of mystic mind. It flies over skies, but orange skies, not full golden light, and therefore it passes the skies of mystic mind. Flew my soul, self lost in the vast of God, in the vastness of the infinite of the divine. Well, this eagle is self lost flying. How does it fly? Now the flight is described the flight. It's a flight in the lost, self lost. Sleepless, wide wings, constant action. There is no sleep. There is no stoppage of the wings. Sleepless, great glimmering wings of wind. It is as speedy as the speed of the, you know, the tempest, wind. The wing and the wind are one. Boar, gold red, seeking of feet. The, the bird that flew had red feet, gold red, that trod space and time's mute vanishing ends, that went beyond the ends of time and space, left the limits of time and space behind and was flying. And face lustered, a bright face appeared, pale blue lined, only outline of a pale blue light of the face of this eagle. It was not an eagle but a hippogriff. It's a combination of, well, you can say, a eagle and a lion and uh, so on, you see? Yes. Pale blue line of hippogriff, ermite, absolutely detached. Soul daring the boneless ways, alone flying in the infinite skies of the God. Over world bare summits, now the world was left behind, so the summits were, you know, exclusive of the world, of timeless being, eternal being, it saw gleaming there, gleamed. The deep twilights of world abyss failed below. World was in twilight, you see, of life and its play and the ocean of life and desire and ideas and thought. The deep twilights of world abyss failed below. Then where was it flying in the lost vasts of God? Sun realms of supernal seeing. It saw realms of solar light all the time, you know, lighted by sunlight. Crimson white mooned oceans of pauseless bliss. Shining white in moonlight, oceans of bliss it saw. Sun realms of constantly lighted regions of consciousness, drew its vague heart earning with voices sweet. It heard sweet voices toward that side and it went on flying because its heart was attracted. It was hungering, large-souled, to surprise the uncon secrets. It wanted to know the secret of the last beyond. Fire veiled, Veiled by fire. Where there is a veil of fire, it wanted to break through and know the secret. What is this world? What is, who is that responsible for all this? Thought wants to know it, you see. Hungering large soul to surprise the uncon secrets. White fire veiled of the last beyond. Crossing power swept silences. Silence over which power, like a tempest, was sweeping. Power swept silences, 
rapture stun. This bird flying is stunned by rapture. What power, what wonderful word region. Crossing powers of rapture stun, climbing high, far ethers, eternal sun, going into the ethers of consciousness where sun shines eternally. Thought the great winged wanderer Paraclete disappeared. He crossed and disappeared. Slow singing a flame word rune. You know, rune is a mystic uh, repetition like mantra. Rune is a, yes, yes. Slow singing a flame word rune. It just uh, slowly singing a rune, it disappeared. Then when thought disappeared, completely silent, mind is vacant, absolutely no thought because thought has disappeared. Self was left alone. Then I knew what myself. Self was left alone, limitless, nude, immune. See? Now there you get something of the modern poet. Both of God to the high master in London, St. Paul's High School, you know, St. Paul's School High Master, Mr. Gilks, I think. And I read his Rose of God. He was. Couldn't believe that one could write in English that. The Englishman, high master of St. Paul. When I, I, we met about, he wanted not to give me more than 15 minutes. He thought some Indian, some foreigner has come and he might take my time. So, but I persisted. He said, but what do you want? I refuse to talk on radio, on the phone. So, I told him I want to see. Uh, it took one month, but I refused to. Uh, to, to, to simply talk off like that. I wanted to go there and find out everything about Sharandos being there in the high school and so on. So he gave me 15 minutes. I said, all right. And it became one hour and 45 minutes. <laughs> he forgot all about his 15 minutes and he began to talk. <laughs> At the end of the talk, you got so interested about who is Sharando and everything about him. He brought the record and register and his scholarship and everything and then he asked me about uh, ashram and all this uh, about his uh, then i told him uh, we are parting he said oh i'm so sorry three times the man came to remind him you see one assistant mm -hmm. came one student came and so, so and so on uh, so salute and uh, there is a form and there so english have got that conservative ways you must never forget that you know high master is somebody when he walks everybody. attention like that so uh, when we are talking somebody uh, it's time for this. Oh, I'll come after this. Like that, two, three times you gave it off. Third time I told you, I think you are pressed for your time and I think I will take leave. Uh, so he said, yes, but uh, come again. And every time you are welcome. And he asked me to lunch afterwards. After a week, I had a lunch with all the boys. <laughs> <laughs> all the boys there on the table with the two teachers and so on. But that was by the way. Then I told him, now look, I'm parting and I'm going. And I want to read one poem of his at least to show you what he has done to your language. All right. And then I got up and read Rose of God. He was like that. I couldn't believe that somebody could write that in English. Something, something superb. He grasped this and I gave him the poem also. And ever since, whatever I write, when you write, you're always welcome. He told me, he wrote me a letter in India afterward that whenever you come to England, remember, you are always invited here. I said, yes, I hope so. <laughs> but he was very well, very much impressed by this Rose of God, which is another of his great poems. A short one, it's not long, it says a sonnet, you see. A bird of fire and Rose of God. There are nine such poems, you see, sonnets. Top, from form to substance to rhythm to everything, the imagery, the symbolism, there is something you can't do it with mind. The color, the color. he has many. <laughs> oh my God, colors you can't match. <laughs> Tremendous color. Vermilion stain on the sapphire of heaven. That's how it begins. You see. Rose of God, <laughs> fire tinged with ecstasy seven, leap up in the heart of our humanhood, oh mystery, oh mystery, 
Yes. The last line is taken. But it is it is like that. It is full of color. Oh. <laughs> Liar, he writes. So L Y R E. Colors liar. You see? Force of infinity. Colors liar. <laughs> <laughs> Liar on which you play colors. As a major, it is tremendous. <laughs> you said about the, the infinite and the knower is finite. I missed a word in there. Mm -hmm. the infinite and the knower is finite. Yes. Did you say the infinite is and the knower is finite? Or what the the object of knowledge, the thing to know. How the thing which has to be known is infinite. The object of knowledge is infinite. And the knower of that object is finite, you see. The thing to know is infinite. But because mind starts with detail, so it thinks, no, no, there's no infinite, only I'll know detail by detail. It will never know. <laughs> mind starts with a confidence that I will take one by one all the trees and then I will know the forest. But unless you know the forest, you can't know the functioning of the tree. Proper tree. Oh, Sir Herbert Reed, Education for Peace. Yes, Isn't that right? that's a book on education. That's not poems, but uh, that's another. His book, a book of poems, a collection. You know, this is Mutations of the Phoenix is one collection, but also collected works of Sir Herbert Reed. That's a different two volumes I think he has got separately published at separate times. Is it called on education or education? For no, peace? no, education for peace. Yeah. Meeting with Gibran is in this line of poetry. You know Gibran? Yes, Leo. I read some of his. Few, not much to say. The expression is inspired from the higher vital. It's a higher vital inspiration. On the, on the level where the vital can go to the highest, you see. I don't know how far it is uh, a expression of the infinite spiritual truth, you see, but it is spiritual truth perceived on the level of the higher vital. Mm -hmm. It is spiritual truth perceived by the higher vital. To recollect some of his, I read some long ago also, I must say. Prophet. Mm -hmm. I read a book called The Prophet. Also, there are two or three more, I yeah, think. Yeah. Yes, there are two or three more. I, I read some of parts of The Prophet, I remember distinctly. Uh, the new style is like, I like the style. I mean, the form is nice. I, I enjoy the form. Really? Uh, yes, really? Yeah, form. The substance, I don't know whether it is adequate to the form from the point of view of the higher spirituality, but it is quite a beautiful expression, no doubt. And he has touched the reality from the higher vital, so that it is not simply form. The substance is there. The substance is perceived on the higher vital level as far as I could see. Mm -hmm. But I read it long ago. I would like to read it again and then for my real I mean, impression. Would you say that's the Gaur's poetry too? Oh, poetry. yes, of course. It's higher vital, I mean? Yes, aesthetic vital. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Here is more vital, Tagore is more aesthetic. Sense of beauty and sense of harmony and color and word and its rhythm and form dominates. It's a very fine perception that way and also his sense of... Did we not deal with that? No? Well, yes, we had a question on Tagore, but I was just... You did speak uh -huh. about Tagore. But I was just thinking of, uh, of him in connection with Gibran, and um, there seems a, to me a similarity in their poetry. That is the you know, mm. aspect of the note of beauty. No, Tagore is uh, far mm. more aesthetically beautiful. Tagore's sense of beauty is more delicate and finer than you are. Superior. You read it in translation, that's why. Yes, that's right. <laughs> you read not uh, Tagore in the original. Yeah, oh, no, no. <laughs> Translations don't represent. <laughs> they cannot. That is the difficulty with art, you see. You cannot fully represent. It requires one with a double genius. 
That is the rare gift of Sri Aurobindo. That well, some of Gobran also can't play it, actually. Hmm. Some of that. Gobran, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, didn't Gaurav write in English too? Didn't he? His original poems are all in Bengal. And even when he translated, it was always an effort. A good work. Uh -huh. It's nothing to do with it. You can't. Oh, it. No, it cannot complain. Mm -hmm. Our language isn't as rich. Our language isn't as yes. rich as uh, it contains substance of what he says and some uh, I, uh, aesthetic, you know, I mean, mm -hmm. it's not that, not that you, have uh, you can't have that in color, I mean, that word rhythm and that color and that, uh, you know, idea, you can't get that, image you can't get fully. 20 or 25 of his poems are top in the world, world literature, nobody can come near it. Very wonderful rhythms. You can't change a comma or word. <laughs> Such a perfect form, mm. substance and form going together. Something very living in the sense of beauty. And Sri Nani, so many times I've been able to help sick people to the poor place to go. Yes. And I remember one time I was in the house with this woman around. She was very delicate and she had star or sleep and she couldn't get to sleep and uh, I read in this poem and one phrase in this poem was rummaging and pillaging my treasure of fragrance and she said that line oh you know you know you're very deep sleep and I have so many sacred memories mm -hmm. almost for Friend, but yeah, I just left the book there and I took it to the BB ward in spite of all regulations and I said, here, <laughs> take this and read it. And the two women read it and they, that one when he said, I, I doubt if I leave, I know my faith the way I did with something. <laughs> yes, that happens in some cases when it comes at the right time, it helps mm -hmm. a lot, mm -hmm. quite a lot. I had a very strange experience in South Africa when I was there in, in Bulwayo, means uh, Rhodesia. One lady was brought up on chair. She was nervous wreck. I think she had either paralysis or something. I don't know what it was. And uh, then somebody told her, I don't know what report they must have reported that somebody come from India and so on, so on. They have that idea of mystic India and yoga and all that sort of thing. So she was brought there. Now, it was Indian association where the meeting was held, but all the Indians, uh, you know, made room for all the Europeans because it is all international gathering. So Indians were the, like guests, you see, I mean, Europeans were guests and Indians were like hosts. So all the Indians stood and all the Europeans were asked to sit down. And she was brought a little late because she was a cripple, you see, on a chair, two or three people she brought there. I don't know what I spoke. I don't remember even now what I spoke. That day, she was listening with great attention. That much I could see, that's all. When that was finished, third day I received a letter from this lady. I didn't know that it was she. I asked my friend, and he said that was the lady who came on the chair who brought that. And she said, I was thinking of committing suicide. After this lecture, I decided to live because I now find a meaning in my living. Mm -hmm. Well, <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> well, there was a case of a divorce. <laughs> it was surprising. <laughs> Where the, the, the Two parties wrote to me that they are going to make up and uh, try to come to private understanding. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what I talked to bring about those results, but anyway, they were there. <laughs> it was the advocate who wrote to me who was appointed as arbiter with arbitration between the two. <laughs> Trying to persuade them not to go to court, and they were persisting. But after the lecture, they came and said, no, we have decided not to go to court. <laughs> you, you decide. <laughs> so there's a human cycle. Yes, human cycle. That's it. Today evening will be human cycle. And I think we'll be through in four, five sittings, perhaps. Four sitting more, perhaps. Or five. Two on life divine which you have postponed mm -hmm. about origin of ignorance, that at least one or two. And yes, one of the Yes, that is one we have to do.
No, there's another one. Oh, no, I'm thinking of the one on uh, good and evil, or is that the one? Yes, that's the same it thing. It's something of the same thing. Hmm. Origin of ignorance. It's a further degree of ignorance, that's all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, what, do you know when you're going to give that? Life divine will be a little later. We shall finish this. Uh, I don't know what to take up in the morning. I, we can take up Savitri also. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Well, Tompkins is coming. Yes. Today or tomorrow? Today. This afternoon. This afternoon. Then mm -hmm. we can do tomorrow. Perhaps. You would like to know that? No. Mm -hmm. <laughs> No, well, life divine, perhaps. Oh, oh, oh life divine, yes. Yeah. Tomorrow morning. Mm. Tomorrow morning. Morning or night? Yes, tomorrow morning. We take up one. Divine tomorrow. What is left? Because we must finish subject by subject, you see, and uh, get out of the whole schedule now. That would be one before the last or last? I don't know. We'll see. We'll see. One more or the that one and one more might be the last on life divine. That would sum up this subject. Savitri we have to take up now. Mm -hmm. I was thinking that I might do it in common with San Francisco. I don't know. One idea struck me not to, to save my labor. It's only not good to do like that because I never do like that. But here... I might do that. <laughs> you mean give us Savitri here too, yes. and be preparing for San Francisco. Yes, for San Francisco. That would be saving the trouble. Yes. Poem. Rose of God, vermilion stain on the sapphires of heaven. Rose of bliss, fire sweet, seven tinged with ecstasy seven. Leap up in our heart of humanhood, O oh miracle, O oh flame, passion flower of the nameless, bud of the mystical name. Rose of God, great wisdom bloom on the summits of being. Rose of light, immaculate core of ultimate seeing. Live in the mind of our earthhood, O oh, golden mystery, flower, sun on the head of the timeless, guest of the marvelous hour, rose of God, damask force of infinity, red icon of might, rose of power with thy diamond halo piercing the night, a blaze in the will of the mortal, design the wonder of thy plan. Image of immortality, outbreak of Godhead in man. Rose of God, smitten purple with incarnate divine desire. Rose of life, crowded with petals, colors lyre. Transform the body of the mortal like a sweet and magical rhyme. Bridge our earthhood and heavenhood, make deathless the children of time. Rose of God, like a blush of rapture on eternity's face. Rose of love, ruby depth of all being, fire passion of grace. Arise from the heart of the yearning that sobs in nature's abyss. Make earth the home of the wonderful and life beatitude's kiss. Mm -hmm. Son of the manifestation of the divine as the world. That's the rose of God. The true manifestation behind the world of ignorance. It is there already. That's why it is referring. It's an aspect of true knowledge, aspect of power, aspect of delight, an aspect of grace. For rapture and eternity space. What a praise. <laughs> so it's like this. Bird of fire mm -hmm. is powerful, very mm -hmm. powerful. I have seen both of those. Huh? Mm -hmm. I've read both of those. Mm -hmm. Bird of fire and rose of God. I don't know what that's all over. He said he was frightened. Able, able to communicate. It's not that it's meant uh, for a few. It's meant for anybody who can uh, receive the communication. Uh, it has to prepare itself to receive. For eating, there is a 
qualification, you have to qualify yourself. <laughs> it's put in poem. Poem is an experience, it's not written for poetry. Drafts, you don't see a comma or anything change like that. It's not written like that, I want to write a poem. <laughs> no. No. Simply written like that, from beginning to end like that, it's end, finished, drop. So the last poems, you see the original draft is there. They have got the original press copy. You seen that, no? Last poem. Yes, I am, I will see after. Yes, yes, that's it. That's how he, that's how he used to write his poems. There is no afterwards correction. <laughs> it is like that, it comes, comes, finished. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, read with, uh, what can we say about poetry? That is written in heaven, is it? It's written the four times. Yes, it's written in heaven. I think who was it? Emerson. No, well, I think. Oh, it is. Uh, I, he, he has written that. Oh. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Sure. Mm. Uh, it is already like that. Mm -hmm. Oh yes, that is Shyamdas' thesis. World of harmony from where artists, all artists receive. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But musician. Mm -hmm. Well, like all artists, there is a world of harmony. Shyamdas and Mother have both experienced and spoken about it. That there is a world of harmony. And any artist who wants to create greatly or truly, well, has only to open himself to that harmony, world of harmony, and receive it. He might receive one bit and then start creating something here on his own. It also happens. It's not that everything is received by everybody. It is only like a man like Beethoven or, you know, the, the whole thing is received like that in mass. Or other people, if they receive even one bit of harmony, on that their own musical capacity works and creates something around that first center uh, intuitive reception, you see, that's how it works. But uh, I think it is A who has written that the first the poems are written in heaven mm -hmm. and then only they come down on earth. That's the meaning of it, that is the world of harmony pre-exists the creation here. <laughs> mm -hmm. It is somewhere else and from there the world of harmony, the things are coming down. Mm -hmm. One is not creating from here, nobody can create here, there is nothing to create here, what is there? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's, all, it's all empty, there's nothing. Yes. And I mean, great, some great poetry. Great poetry takes a bit, uh, one wing of earth and the other in heaven. Yes, that's how it is. You see, it is from here that you project and bring it here, like that. You remain here, but you can't create from here. Hmm, that's it. You stand here and receive. That's how all great creators have done that. How to do that? I remember reading about Blake. Uh, days before he died, just a few days before he died, his poor ignorant wife sat beside him. And great poetry kept flooding through him, but she couldn't write it down. Mm. And I thought, oh, what a loss. <laughs> what a terrible loss. <laughs> you see, it deals with a Portuguese or Spanish small sloop that fought against a German battleship and refused to surrender against a very big battleship. They had no equipment and they fought, fought to the last man. That's all. But that subject he has taken up, right? Wonderful way of rendering the subject. Terbrio, that's the name. The Canaris was a ship, German ship. And uh, these people were fishermen, ordinary fishermen. They were on fishing boat and they encountered this. And they were asked to surrender. They refused to surrender. That's all. Freedom is more than a word. That's how he begins, you see. <laughs> she is mortal, let me say it's like that. Then when they die and the whole thing is on flame, he says, then it was seen how the, the, the power and the flame of the soul was seen when the people were burning and the ship was burning. It gave the 
flame of the soul. 